AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Welcome back to another edition of the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Got a great show lined up for you today. Senior legal editor for Breitbart News, Ken Kukowski. <laughs> We're going to talk about the lunacy uh, of a second day, uh, a third day is getting ready for a third day of of the confirmation hearings. And then Dylan Gwynn from Breitbart Sports will join us and we'll talk about all things Nike. But we're going to start off with the sound bites. This is why I love the freedom of speech, because if they weren't allowed to speak like this, we would have to tell you. And if we had to tell you what they said, you wouldn't believe it or how they acted, you wouldn't believe it. I'll let you listen to the sound bites. First of all, I want you to listen to uh, Jay Steklow on Fox News talking about the hearing. I've argued in front of the Supreme Court for over three decades. And the idea that a nominee of a sitting president would have to recuse himself involving cases that might involve the president or policies of the president uh, would mean justices would be recusing themselves on every case. So that's, that's absurd. What is Brett Kavanaugh going to do? If a case comes before him, he's going to review the briefs, listen to the oral arguments, and make a decision to defend the Constitution of the United States as he views the Constitution. That is what we expect of Article Three judges. That is what we expect of Supreme Court justices. And, you know, I, I noticed on some of the other networks they were talking about this, you know, Brett Kavanaugh uh, having a grilling, is one one of the networks said uh, today before the uh, Judiciary Committee. Now, I know, Shannon, you've been covering this for a long time, and you've been covering it today and, and very thoroughly, but there was no grilling of Brett Kavanaugh. In fact, Dianne Feinstein had to come in at one point to correct Senator Leahy, who was pointing out and trying to cross-examine, so to speak, Brett Kavanaugh with a document saying there was a reference to him in this particular document. And when everybody looked at it and Senator Leahy finally was told that it doesn't reference the nominee to the Supreme Court, and it was Senator Feinstein that says he's not in it, it's not there. Oh, okay, let's go to the next document. So the lack of preparation, this is a lot of show. The fact is, under the Constitution, Brett Kavanaugh has a job to do when he is confirmed, and he will be confirmed as a justice of the Supreme Court, and I suspect before the first Monday in October that he will be a justice on that court. And the fact is, he reviews the law, reviews the facts, listens to the arguments, and makes a decision like every other justice in the Supreme Court. Yep, it's that simple, and all you have to do is listen to him. But apparently, the left isn't listening to him because if you've if you've heard anything, you know all of the protests, all of the um, the hullabaloo from the left, all of the uh, insanity uh, is about one thing: it's about on-demand abortion. That's it. That was what the women's march was about. That's what this is all about. Judge Kavanaugh has made his stance very clear, but listen as he does it once again, because they've asked him about 56,000 times. Do you agree with Justice O'Connor that a woman's right to control her reproductive life impacts her ability to, part- to quote, participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation, end quote? Well, as a general proposition, I understand the importance of the precedent set forth in Roe v. Wade. So Roe v. Wade held, of course, and it's reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that a woman has a constitutional right to obtain an abortion before viability, subject to reasonable regulation by the state, up to the point where that regulation constitutes an undue burden on the woman's right to obtain an abortion. And one of the reasons for that holding, as explained by the court, in Roe and Uh, also in Planned Parenthood versus Casey more fully, is along the lines of what you said, Senator Feinstein, about 
uh, the quote from Justice O'Connor. So that's one of the rationales that undergirds Roe v. Wade. It's one of the rationales that undergirds Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Well, let me give you another one rationale. In the 1950s and 60s, the two decades before Roe, deaths from illegal abortions in this country ran between 200,000 and 1.2 million. That's according to the Guttmacher Institute. So a lot of women died in that period. The question comes, and you have said today, uh, not today, but in, it, it's been reported that you have said that Roe is now settled law. The first question I have of you is, what do you mean by settled law? I tried to ask earlier, do you believe it is correct law? Um, have your views on whether Roe is settled precedent or could be overturned? And, and has your views changed since you were in the Bush White House? Senator, I um, said that it's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years, as you know. And uh, most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. And as you well recall, Senator, I know uh, when that case came up, the Supreme Court didn't just reaffirm it uh, in passing. The court specifically went through all the factors of stare decisis in considering whether to overrule it. And the joint opinion of Justice Kennedy, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Souter at great length went through that, those factors. That was the question presented in the case. I don't know how many other ways he can say it. Uh, and you heard him say it over and over and over again. Did you notice what she said? I don't want this point to be to be lost. She said, well, you said, oh, it's in this document. Well, I heard that you said. I mean, she went from literally, you've said this to, well, what I meant to say was it was in paper to, well, say I heard it from somebody. I mean, it, all in, in a matter of about four seconds when she was asking him a question. Senator Feinstein feels like Bill Maher to me. The lunacy, the idiocy, and the and the and the craziness that that they spew is pretty consistent. But every now and then, uh, a sunburst of sanity peeps through, and and they say something real. I guess is 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 what I would say. And and every she does that once once a, it sees about once every twenty four hours she'll say something lucid and coherent. But then she pressed Justice Kavanaugh on. Uh, which a lot of the liberals yesterday were asking, uh, and you heard Jay Sekulow talk about this very thing in the first soundbite, but listen to her ask about Justice Kavanaugh and potential prosecution of President Trump. I have repeatedly called U.S. v. Nixon one of the four greatest moments in Supreme Court history. Uh, so I've called that, the four I've always identified are Marbury versus Madison, Youngstown Steel, Brown versus Board of Education, and United States versus Richard Nixon. And why, why have I, Brown versus Board, by the way, the single greatest. Was moment. it rightly decided? So uh, I have said that, I've said yes, that a, the court's holding that a criminal trial subpoena to a president in the context of the, uh, the uh, special counsel regulations in that case uh, for information, a criminal trial subpoena for information under the specific regulations in that case, I have said that holding is one of the four greatest moments in Supreme Court history. So not only what I was, I can explain how that misunderstanding came up, because that's, I know there was a news story about that, and that's just not correct impression of my views. My views have been consistently, why was it one of the greatest moments? It was one of the greatest moments because of the political pressures of the time. The court stood up for judicial independence in a moment of national crisis. That's what you, the Supreme Court, uh, we need the Supreme Court to decide the things we can foresee. But one of the things that's really important for the Supreme Court, we're going to have crisis moments of the Supreme Court on things we can't even predict. And we need people on the Supreme Court who are prepared for that. She wasn't the only one. They were pressing left and right. Kamala Harris who got absolutely destroyed 
by Condoleezza Rice in in a in a one of the, my favorite bits and pieces of the exchange. He, she Kamala Harris, and again her and Cory Booker are running for office. That's all I can tell you. Amidst all of this, we have what appears to be book number seventy four of people who are trying to make money. NBC Nightly News says an anonymous official, which if you're talking about NBC or New York Times means we just made it up, a cluster of top aides are working against parts of the Trump agenda. Listen listen to this. An extraordinary alarm sounded from the inside out, jaw-dropping charges against the president by someone who says they work for him. An anonymous source describing a secret cluster of top aides, quote, working diligently from within to frustrate parts of his agenda and his worst inclinations. I would know, the author writes, I am one of them. The New York Times late today publishing that op-ed, choosing not to share who wrote it, but describing them as an official whose job would be jeopardized if their identity was revealed. The headline, I am part of the resistance inside the Trump administration. When you tell me about some anonymous source within the administration, probably who's failing and probably here for all the wrong reasons. If the failing New York Times has an anonymous editorial, can you believe it? Anonymous, meaning gutless, a gutless editorial. Uh, We're doing a great job. The writer praising some of the president's successes, but arguing they've come despite, not because of, his leadership style. Describing half-baked, ill-informed, and occasionally reckless decisions that have to be walked back. At one point, the official describes early whispers within the cabinet of invoking the 25th Amendment to remove the president. But no one wanted to precipitate a constitutional crisis. Americans should know that there are adults in the room, the person writes. We fully recognize what is happening, and we are trying to do what's right, even when Donald Trump won't. The explosive op-ed echoes the portrait painted in a bombshell new book of a chaotic White House driven by dysfunction. The president doesn't believe any of it. The book means nothing. It's a work of fiction. If you look back at Woodward's past... He had the same problem with other presidents. He likes to get publicity, sell some books. The book's author, Bob Woodward, one of the most well-respected journalists of his generation, whose reporting helped bring down Richard Nixon. For the American people, why should they believe you over Bob Woodward? Well, if you look at Bob Woodward's track record, I mean, he had the same problem with Obama. Every time he wrote a book, they were complaining about it. They were complaining about the lack of accuracy. Woodward tells NBC News he stands by his reporting. And the president tonight seemed to refer to that anonymous op-ed with a tweet of just a single word, treason. And the press secretary is now calling the writer a coward, saying whoever it was should resign. All of it, Lester, capping yet another extraordinary and explosive day inside this West Wing. So all of that aside, did you notice how excited these women were to report this story? I mean, you could actually hear the excitement in their voices as they told you that someone that the uh, New York Times had used an anonymous source. Think about this. An anonymous source to write an op-ed, which basically means I can write whatever I want under an anonymous source and have it be opinion and not be true and not get in trouble. It feels perfect from a a planned perspective when you talk about Woodward. uh, I mean, Woodward and Bernstein, have they turned into uh, Siegfried and Roy? And which one's going to get mauled if that's the case? You guys heard Bernstein the other day uh, basically get caught lying his ass off. And and Woodward has done it before as well. So anyway, most respected members of the media. That's like saying this guy is the most respected member of the chain gang in jail. Anyway, uh, one of the brightest, smartest political minds, uh, I think, of our lives uh, has been uh, a guy uh, who was a former House Speaker, Newt Gingrich. Listen to him talk about the op-ed, and, and, and I mean, just in ways that are rational and normal and, and, and real-world thinking. North Korea announced yesterday that they wanted to get to a nuclear-free Korea, which should have been a big deal. Kavanaugh is steadily moving towards becoming the next Supreme Court justice, which ought to be a big deal. The economy is booming. These are all real things. Over here is the liberal media running in circles, uh, totally crazed. Uh, and I think that the gap here, I think the president had it exactly mm. right. Uh, and I think historians will look back and think that the left just, much like what happened in the Senate, the left just kind of went crazy this year. 
But the thing is, Newt, uh, it's not really the liberal media, unless the New York Times is totally going to get out of the news business entirely. It was somebody from the inside that checked out as somebody on the inside. They got it on Monday. They published it on Wednesday sure. afternoon. So it's real. You walk in there when we so don't. Much. You talk to the president when the curtain's down. Do you sense that people that work for him feel this way? First of all, there are several thousand political appointees. So mm -hmm. who knows? Every president, if you go as a historian, I can just tell you, you can go to president after president. Is there somebody in the White House who's unhappy or somebody who is such a remarkable genius that they're offended because Trump, you know, doesn't use the right language? I mean, who knows? My, my point would be deeper. This stuff is all junk well, because the fact is the White House is functioning. The fact is, we're about to get our second Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. The fact is, the economy is growing. I mean, if Trump is so incompetent, how's all this stuff happening? Bingo. Uh, that's how it works. It's all happening. And, and, and by an anonymous source, this could absolutely be uh, some basement-dwelling, low-life secretary. Uh, and by basement-dwelling, I mean White House basement. Basement-dwelling... Uh, secretary, who's one of the thousands of secretaries for the thousands of appointees, is what it could be. That he's right. And I'll bet you that's who it ends up being. We'll, we'll, I, I think we'll find out at some point. We'll find out. This will be the deep throat, right? I mean, uh, that, that, that's how that's going to play out. The sound bites, again, you just can't make this stuff up. This is These are unhinged people on the brink, and apparently they're, they're elected. Uh, and they are a bunch of front holes. So... Anyway, we're going to take a short break. Uh, on the other side, senior legal editor for Breitbart News, Ken Klukowski, is going to join us. Back in just a minute. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Jeannie in Pennsylvania. I figure he's gotten away from what we really hired him to do, which is draining the swamp. If you look at the real picture of draining a swamp, you go in and you take all the water out of it. What sure. does it leave? It leaves the gunk. He cannot mm. get rid of the gunk. We have to get rid of the gunk. Everything he's doing, he's lowering the water so we can see who needs to go. The only way they can go is if we vote them out. Breitbart News Daily. Weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now is senior legal editor Ken Kukowski from Breitbart News. Good morning, Ken. How you doing, buddy? Good morning. How are you, Kurt? Great to be with you. So I'm going to open with this. A, a couple years back when... Um, uh, uh, I think it was Ginsburg and uh, Justice Dyer were being uh, uh, going through their hearings. Uh, uh, we were watching them do this as uh, Whitewater surrounded the Clintons in the Paula Jones scandal. Um, apparently, uh, that's okay uh, when it's a sitting Democrat, but when it's a Republican under who is not the target of an investigation, it's not okay, number one. Number two, I was told by liberals – that the uh, American Bar Association is the is the gold standard number one, <laughs> and right. number two, a judge's body of work, uh, a judge's body of work is is the most important thing that there can be. The ABA gave uh, Justice Kavanaugh their highest rating, number one, and number two, his three hundred and seven rulings and involvement in three hundred and ninety one rulings is more than the previous five justices combined. So tell me why we're watching what we're watching. Well, actually, let me just split out those uh, last. Uh that last sentence, because it actually has two overlapping points, and that is that we have 11,000 pages of judicial opinions that Brett Kavanaugh has either written or joined as one of the two non-writing member of a three-judge panel. So we have 11,000 pages, almost 5,000 of which he wrote and about 6,000 of which uh, a, a co-panelist on the three-judge panels for his various appeals wrote. And you're right that that is the clearest indication into a person's judicial philosophy. That is why when, when Sonia Sotomayor was being considered, the Senate was only looking at 6,000 pages because those were the pages of all of her judicial opinions. Uh, Kavanaugh's body of work is about twice that size. But in terms of the five-time reference, that's actually something different. As I said, 6,000 pages with Sonia Sotomayor. If you look at, uh, for example, uh, 
uh, Chief Justice John Roberts. He had a lot of experience in the executive branch, in the in the White House, in the Justice Department, etc. And so the, there was a total of seventy-two thousand pages in doc, of documents for him. Okay, but when Elena Kagan was nominated, uh, the um, when Elena Kagan was nominated, she had never been a judge. And so it was a matter of what kind of material do we have to evaluate her judicial philosophy. So they had to look at all of these records from her government service in the White House, in the Justice Department, all, uh, uh, and of course her private sector career. Everything she did uh, at, together came to a total of 170,000 pages of documents. Now – when that was the last nominee for Barack Obama. So Barack Obama's first nominee, 6,000 pages. Second was 170,000 pages. When Trump got elected, you had Neil Gorsuch. Now Gorsuch, like Sotomayor and like others, he had been actually a judge for a decade. So you had a lot of opinions from him. But Republicans decided to go the extra mile. They wanted to actually beat the all-time record that had been established with Kagan. And again, Kagan's number was so high because we had zero judicial opinions to look at. So they looked at everything. They, they overturned every stone in her life going back to infancy to try to find uh, writings where, that would uh, indicate her philosophy in the law. So with Neil Gorsuch, they came out to 184,000 pages. That became the new all-time record. Right now, as we speak today, senators have 480,000 pages on Brett Kavanaugh. They have not just the 11,000 pages of all of his opinions, but they have hundreds of thousands of pages from his service in the White House, in public life, etc. That is where that five times number becomes. If you add up all the pages handed over for, for, for Gorsuch, for Kagan, for Sotomayor, for Alito, you have to go back five nominees before you exceed the number that we just have on him alone. Uh, uh, an all-time high in more than twice of what we have ever had for any nominee in 200 years. So that that's actually the two points. I know there's a lot of numbers there by what to unpack what no, we have No, but there. I was trying to think of uh, an analogy, uh, 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 a, a comparison, and the only thing I could come up with is this. Watching Kamala Harris or, or Cory Booker or Dianne Feinstein try and embarrass uh, Justice Kavanaugh is like watching Mike Tyson fight Mini Me. Uh, there, there is, it, it is so over. And, and listen, I, I, I thought uh, it was amusing Ken, yesterday. I thought it was amusing when Diane Feinstein, who isn't even a lawyer, by the way, she never went to law school. She doesn't have a law degree. She was trying to school one of the most brilliant and accomplished lawyers in America, who is also a long-serving judge on the nuances of the doctrine of stare decisis in judicial precedent. You have to understand Kavanaugh is literally wrote the book on precedent. He is the co-author of a 700-page book, which I have on my bookshelf. And I'll tell you, let's just say I haven't read the whole thing. <laughs> I've, I've read parts of it, but I have not read the whole thing. He literally wrote the book on judicial precedent as an acclaimed legal scholar, as a brilliant lawyer, as a longstanding judge. And here you get Feinstein yesterday uh, with, her, with, with her lack of a law degree. <laughs> trying to trying to school him on it. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was for I think for every lawyer in America and for millions of non lawyers, you just laugh when you see that. Can you do me a favor and make uh, give a quick layman's explanation of stare decisis? Because I've heard uh, uh, him referred. Refer to that, and it's very, very important in this whole scheme of things. Sure, ha happy to, Kurt. The uh, America, like England, and our our legal system was inherited from England. We brought it over from England with us. We are common law countries. That means we're a country of that when <sighs> story decisis. The concept of precedent is that in a nation under the rule of law. It is almost always, not always, and that's where we get into the exceptions, but almost always, it is more important for a legal question to be settled than to 100% of the time be settled correctly. The idea that once something has worked its way through the entire judicial process, that at that point you need to have stability in the law, 
You need to have predictability in the law. People and companies and organizations need to be able to rely upon it. They need to make life-changing decisions on a settled expectation of what the law is that they are subject to. And so once a matter has been decided, a court must adhere to that precedent unless there is an extraordinary reason to change it. And the extraordinary reason can never be because the first decision was wrong. Because then you would never have a stability in the law because any future court could always overturn anything they had ever done previously. Now, that works horizontally and vertically. Obviously, when you're talking about lower and higher courts, if a higher court's decided that the lower court has no choice, they can never revisit that. But when we're talking in the Supreme Court context, it becomes a question of the Supreme Court revisiting its own precedents, which they do rarely. It does happen. But it is done very rarely. Normally, the precedents are modified or they are narrowed in their scope. It only happens with all the decisions that come down. It's only a couple times a year, I would say, that uh, that a precedent gets overruled. And 90 percent of those are on little technical interpretive matters that, you know, your listeners eyes would glaze over if I tried to start giving examples. Am I correct in saying basically it's predictability? It's consistency. Yes. It's the ability yes, yes, to understand that the law isn't going to go. Like tomorrow, the Second Amendment is not going to just go away, right? I mean, right, it, right. It, that's, it, that, that's exactly kind of right. That- and in fact, Kurt, let me jump in and say that that also gets into the idea of what's called positive law, which means written law. Judges in our system. Almost always, we are a positive law nation. That means the judges don't just sit around and make stuff up. It means there's a text that they are actually interpreting. Sometimes that text is a regulation. And if it is, you know, the government agency can change that regulation anytime it wants, subject to the procedural, you know, the process set forth in the Administrative Procedure Act. If the text is a statute, which is higher than a regulation, well, Congress can change that anytime it wants. The highest legal text is the U.S. Constitution, because the only way you can change that is to actually pass an amendment to the Constitution, which is very rare. And that is why uh, stare decisis, when it comes to statutes or regulations, stare decisis pretty much means that you never overrule precedent. Because for those lower laws, as the Supreme Court explains, look, if there's something wrong with a regulation or a statute, regulators or Congress, they can change that any time they want. There's no need for us to really weigh in when it comes to that. But because it's almost impossible, unbelievably rare to change the words of the Constitution, that's where when the court really screws up a constitutional matter, and if it becomes clear in the following years that it was grievously wrong and that it's just got the whole country on a wrong course, that's where you get into a discussion about stare decisis to determine whether the conditions are met to actually revisit that constitutional ruling because the positive law, the, the words of the law that are being interpreted, those are words that, like the Second Amendment, can't change unless you pass a new amendment which is why you have the separation of powers because ultimately changing what we call almost a perfect document should be insanely hard and it is um unbelievably hard that's right as it should be again it's uh this entire thing um but but let me ask you star decisis is why we have what we call constitutionalists right i mean Justice uh, Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, they're constitutionalists. And by that, I mean they are the judge. They are what every judge should be, which is is a legal mind to uh, enforce the the written words of the Constitution in modern times. Uh, And and to, you know, I I guess in a way I would put it this way. When the framers wrote the Second Amendment, they did so under uh, the guise of a tyrannical government. A constitutionalist today is supposed to be able to translate what that would mean in today's terms, not 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 reinterpret it, but enforce it in 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 the 2018 sense of the Constitution. That's right. Let me let me re- let me restate that in a couple of regards. First of all, every provision in the Bill of Rights was crafted uh, to respond to a specific abuse of power that the first Americans had experienced at the hands of the English government, the English crown, the the Second Amendment being one of them. But whether it's that or a provision in the body of the original Constitution, uh, it's in either one, 
Uh, the only way, because federal judges hold lifetime tenures and are unelected, in between those two things, they are totally politically unaccountable. That's why what we're seeing today on TV is a big deal. Once Justice Kavanaugh is confirmed as a justice, he will never answer again for his actions. He will hold that job for the rest of his life. Uh, but because these judges are politically unaccountable, and because we live in a democratic system of government, a democratic republic, unelected government officers should have very limited powers in a democratic form of government. That's the underlying philosophy behind that. And because of that, that's where we say that judges are bound to merely interpret the law rather than make it. And specifically, because they are unelected and because they are unaccountable, there's only one valid way for them to interpret the Constitution. And that is that they must interpret it according to the original public meaning of its words which we which we uh, determine by examining the text the structure and the history of each constitutional provision to make sure that the judges are faithfully applying the principles that were enshrined by the American people not according to these Ivy League trained judges what they think should be in there but what the American people actually voted to put in there and if that ever needs to be changed then it needs to be changed by the only ones who have the power to do so, and that is the American people through the democratic process. I appreciate that. Ken, it's always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. I'd love to have you back. Thank you, Kurt. God bless. Talk soon. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Mansour. A lot of people not knowing what action they could or should take to make the difference. What I do is try to turn people on to sites like Breitbart, you know, people who are writing and publishing the truth so that people will get educated. But, you know, you kind of can't blame productive members of society who are kind of confused, perplexed as to what do we do to take this government back. Serious XM Patriot. At channel 125. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Gert Schilling. Thanks again to Ken Kukowski, senior legal editor at Breitbart. Joining me now is Dylan Quinn from Breitbart Sports. Good morning, Dylan. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Gert. Thanks for having me on. A uh, litany of things to talk about. We could talk about uh, Colin Kaepernick and Nike. We could talk about uh, the American League East and how it's not a race anymore. But uh, I, I, I'm curious to, to actually talk about something positive. The NFL season opens today, um, uh-huh. and tonight it's going to begin. And by that, I don't mean the game's going to begin, but tonight when the anthem plays, uh, we are going to see protests. And uh, it, as much as we don't want to see it, we're going to see it. Um any thoughts around what you're going to see tonight? Anything out of the ordinary? Any? Are we going to – I mean, I, people just want to watch the games, but we're going to be subjected to this. You know it. Oh, there's no question. We're going to be subjected to it. And, and obviously Malcolm Jenkins, who is one of the leaders of the, of the Players Coalition, the group that met with the owners last year and basically extorted $90 million of the, from them to go to left-wing causes. He's one of the leaders of the protest movement, and he's a Philadelphia Eagle. So he'll be protesting tonight. I mean, one of the things that jumps out to me, Kurt, is that just this week the NFL Players Association re- releases this statement saying they want fans to focus on the activism and the causes and not the protest. And there's a very easy way to get people to stop focusing on the protest, and that's to stop protesting. <laughs> but, as long, but their players well, continue to but, protest. But let me just add, hold on, Dylan. Let me just add, the other way to do that would be to actually state what you're protesting. A- ask the, ask somebody to define why they're kneeling. Because the second they say uh, inordinate amount of oppression from law enforcement, that, that's, a, that's a factual lie. That's not true. That doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. It does. There are cases of, of racism inside the police force, both black on white, white on black. But, but this disproportionate level of violence they want to protest doesn't exist. So please tell me what exactly they are actually protesting, because that's not true. No, they're, they're protesting a lie. I mean, well, they're protesting with a lie. They're, they're protesting with the lie that the, the, the law enforcement, just like Colin Kaepernick said in a tweet two years ago, they equate law enforcement with slave catchers. 
I mean, literally, he put a tweet there, right. you know, saying there was no difference between modern day law enforcement and slave catchers. This is their mentality when it comes to the police. This is their mentality when it comes, you know, to a lesser extent to the military. So again, it's it's, it's a complete lie, but they believe it apparently, uh, and and they're and they're willing to to die on that hill. And and, and it's just incredible to me. That you have them, you know, the, the player association asking people to focus on other things. Stop protesting, and people will stop focusing on the protest. So, yeah. if, if, if you don't, if you don't need to protest in order to advance your cause, then don't do it. And it's very, it's a very simple thing. But they, well, but they can't seem to get away from that. And you know, and I think as we saw with, with Colin Kaepernick, you know, getting the ad campaign from Nike this week. There is a commercial element to this. There's a financial element to this. They don't really want to get away from the protest yeah. because the protest is what keeps the cameras on them. The protest is what keeps all the stories being written about them. And the protest is what keeps them in the public conversation. And as soon as they stop that, they fall out of the public conversation and nobody cares anymore. So they can say that they don't want people to focus well, on this stuff. Right. But really, it's just disingenuous. The other piece to this is – uh, if, if you haven't read uh, either Up From Slavery or My Bond Is My Freedom, I'm so repulsed at the thought of these these multi-million dollar football players using the term slavery. Um, that they have no concept of what slavery is. Uh, they can certainly um, talk about uh, 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 being treated differently as young black men. I'm sure that, that many of them have experiences I don't. But to refer to slavery is is, is – is doing it slavery the service uh, and the horrors and, and the nightmare that it was. Um, that just, I, I don't know. It just, it makes me sick to my stomach. And, and uh, again, ask the, the, uh, any, any player specifically, if you ever get a chance, what exactly, please tell me what you would have changed because I, I don't believe any of them can actually answer that question. And that to me is at the heart of, and the, and the, in the, 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 the I don't even know how to define it. It's just, it's just terrible. It, it, it makes this whole thing. Hey, listen, um, give me a, you, you got a Super Bowl pick this year? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think the Packers are finally due for a healthy season. If they have a healthy season with a healthy Aaron Rodgers and a, and a brand new contract and, and everything they're going to be getting with, uh, with Jimmy Graham and the new tight end they got from, from the Saints, then I, I, I see the Packers going all the way. I really, I think we're going to get a Packers Patriots Super yeah. Bowl. Should have, the Super Bowl we should have had two years ago, or three years ago, when the Seahawks <laughs> sneaked in there because you know the Packers special teams basically cost them the NFC Championship game. But besides that, I, I think we're going to get uh, finally get our Aaron Rodgers Tom Brady Super Bowl, and that is that's going to be one that I think a lot of people have been waiting for for a long time, and that'll be awesome. Packers win it. Though. Yeah, no, that's I, I that's uh, that's a good one. I like it. I like it. Hey, Dylan. Always a pleasure, buddy. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. Final thoughts. I wanted to to go in a little different direction today. Um, the the NFL season kicks off tonight, and uh, all of the things around the NFL uh, and the protests and all this other stuff, it, it harkens me back to a day uh, when I was younger. And I, I, I want to quote uh, a former NBA basketball player, um, in Charles Barkley, I am not a role model, uh, and when we shouldn't be role models as athletes, I want to I want to expound on that a little bit and make sure that that people understand a little bit more about me and what I think. Um, if you're listening to the show, I think maybe that's something that interests you. Um, I am not a role model. Never was a role model as an athlete. I never should have been a role model as an athlete to you or to your children. Um, the job of role models, uh, I'll, I'll, I've met many men, and I've had many incredible people in my life, uh, but no one uh, comes close to and ever will be cl- uh, even remotely on par with uh, my father, who was uh, short of Jesus, was the most important, prolific, uh, uh, integrity-filled human being I've ever met. My role model, my life has been spent trying to make my role model proud of me. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be in the room for me to do the things I do. Um, but athletes are every bit as flawed in every possible way and in many ways more so than you can imagine. Uh, we have the same demons. 
We have the same uh, uh, good and bad traits. Uh, we don't drink any less. Uh, they And I'm not going to say we. I don't mean me. But we, we, we don't drink any less. We don't hit our wives any less. We, we don't uh, do any of that. In fact, in many ways, we do a lot of those things even more so because we are so privileged, because we are so coddled. But I got to tell you, um, if you want to look at how this came to be, and I'm not refer- if you're not guilty of this, then you know I'm not talking about you. But look no farther than the home of the fan, okay? Because you are the people who have held these guys from the time they were high school superstars on a pedestal and have allowed them to not be accountable for the things they do and the things they say. I'll give you a great example, okay? I don't think by any stretch of imagination that you should hold any person to a tweet they made when they were 16, 17, or 18, right? Uh, uh, we do and we say stupid things. I've never said anything racist, so I'm not worried about a racist tweet coming up. But there are guys who are now being called out for tweets they made when they were 16, 17, and 18 that were racist and homophobic and blah, blah, blah. Well, my question is this. Why weren't you offended when they wrote the tweet? Or why weren't the people around them offended when they committed the act or did the thing or said those those things when they did them? Uh, we put these guys and these gals on pedestals in high school. We make them unaccountable. We don't make them pay the price they should pay for being idiots. Then they go to college, and in college, what you have is the thirty-five most, uh, 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 the thirty-five biggest men on campus from high school, or the fifty-three uh, in the same room. Okay, and, and the, all of those are alpha males, and all of those guys have been, uh, for the most part. Uh, the the pride and joy of their community. And that's, again, I'm not talking about every player, every athlete. I'm not going to caveat everything I say by saying, well, I know I don't mean you. The fact of the matter is you know who you are. And then when you go to the pros, you get to a point where you have uh, uh, the ultimate in enabling. Uh, as athletes, uh, I, I can tell you, here, here's one of the things that always I always was curious about. Why was everybody in such a hurry to give me free stuff when of all the people they knew, I was the one that could afford it? It's because they wanted my name and my whatever my brand was associated with their product. And they never thought about the repercussions of, of that association until it became um, Tiger Woods and Nike and Ellen, uh, his wife, and all the things that happened around them. That people were stunned about that. Uh, and it was, uh, it was shocking just because uh, anybody would be stunned about that kind of a story. But we were shocked because it was Tiger Woods. Why are we continually stunned when our athletes do human things and sin like humans do? It, we seem to ble- believe that uh, God-given athletic ability and insanely hard work equates to moral superiority. And they couldn't even be remotely uh, related in any capacity in many ways. And again, that's not to say, there are far more good men and women in professional sports than bad ones. But the news doesn't talk about the good men and women. The, the, the sports don't talk about the good men and women. ESPN doesn't talk. ESPN, they, they talk of black versus white and, and, and uh, uh, you know, good versus evil uh, on the playing field. When, when, uh, and then, honest to God, they try to tell you, well, wh- why do you feel entitled? You're just playing a game. I've been told that. You just played. I didn't play a game. OK, the thing I did was I played in a multi-billion dollar business. And, and, and I don't mean this in an egotistical way, but the fact of the matter is this. A lot of the people that try and uh, uh, jump and, and holler and, and say that uh, get on the things I do. I was better at one thing. And it wasn't just throwing a baseball as stupid as you'd like to think that is. Uh, I was better at this one thing than most people were at everything they've ever done in their life. And it was because I was given a God given talent and I wanted it. And, and, and wanting and needing are two very different things in this generation doesn't get that. But I, 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 I'm I, proud of what I did. And it, but, but throwing a baseball really, really hard, very, very accurately, didn't absolve me from the life's problems. It didn't stop my wife from getting cancer. It didn't stop me from getting cancer. It didn't stop my kids from getting sick. Being an athlete affords you none of the things you think it does from where you sit if you're not that person. I would argue that the one thing it did was it, it allowed me to do things in my life that I love to do. And it wasn't a game. The, 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 I, I can honestly tell you that the, the work that goes into being good at this profession involves 100 million things you could never imagine and think of. But the fact of the matter is it didn't make me better than you. It made me better than you at throwing a baseball. Uh, and, and, and at the end of the day, here's the thing. Um, athletes... Uh, and you hear this LeBron James barbershop thing. They're all talking about, 
I hate when the public does this. You know what? Tough shit. You're a famous athlete that you wanted this your entire life. You got it. There are things it comes with that maybe you don't like. But the fact of the matter is they are what they are. People look up to you whether you like it or not. So, no, you don't have to be a role model. But just know every night that when you go to bed, you will be the somebody. And if that doesn't bother you and that doesn't matter to you, then that speaks more about you than it does about the public. You have a responsibility. I believe God put us on this earth to make a difference in other people's lives. And athletes were given enormously large windows like I was to do that. And I tried to do that when I played. Uh, I, I'm sure I failed miserably in many ways, and as others do. But the, the, I, I at least wanted people to know I tried. So There you go. Uh, good luck to uh, all of the football players kicking off the season. Uh, the ones that don't kneel, I hope they have an incredibly healthy season and a good season. God bless. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll catch up tomorrow uh, to end the week. God bless. Take care. Talk soon. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Everything in hip hop is not bad. Kanye agreed with us, so let's love him today until he raps tomorrow and you turn your back. Because if you jump off when the fun of the moment is over, then you are in fact making Kanye the token he is accused of being. So please. Don't do that. Don't go there. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.